Hello. Thanks for being here. Over the last seven years, I've been a mix of uh, student in uh, machine learning and uh, working at a startup doing machine learning uh, and deep learning, and also working on open source tools for uh, machine learning, and uh, at the same time doing research uh, in machine learning. So over these years, uh, I've just noticed uh, certain trends in the last couple of years, uh, and I wanted to capture them in a talk and also talk a little bit about while I'm building these tools uh, that drive uh, deep learning research, especially, uh, what, like what is exactly in my mind. So starting off it, uh, I want to give a few examples of uh, deployed uh, deep learning uh, today. And uh, to start off it, Facebook, we have uh, uh, the accessible interface where, where you have uh, state-of-the-art image captioning um, that, that helps people um, listen to images, essentially. And uh, there's, there's lots of work in self-driving cars going on, uh, smart apps of all kinds, making you understand how many calories in your food and all of that. Uh, and of course, machine translation, something that I use pretty much every day. Um, and there's, there's all these uh, research in chatbots. I think uh, earlier there was a talk uh, a little bit on uh, chatbots from um, Swisscom. And we have a lot of work going on at Facebook itself on image understanding. We recently released uh, the sharp mask work. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why this is uh, forwarding, uh, sorry, uh, well, again. Well, there's there's a lot of work going on. Uh, robotics, again, uh, uh, the professor at EPFL earlier showed uh, a lot of uh, robotics research. Uh, a lot of it is interactive, uh, part VR, part interactive, and some kind of split. Um, and, and you have all these dynamic models popping up. So this is one example where um, there's a model that will take an image and a question and give you the answer by sort of recursively going through the question um, and, uh, and generating an answer. Um, and you have like a whole class of networks uh, that are uh, popping up uh, uh, which have explicit memory controllers um, with uh, initial uh, work from DeepMind and Facebook sort of bootstrapping a whole class of new networks. And, and there's adversarial networks, which are, again, these dynamical systems which have a generator and discriminator. And they sort of, you can have multiple generators and discriminators and uh, have all these interactions which are uh, very non-stationary uh, in terms of the optimization procedure. And more, more examples of adversarial networks. Not only can you just generate images, but you can transform one, one sets of images to another. And this is just a whole section of what I thought was a summary over the last uh, couple of years uh, of the research that I've been seeing. Um, and one of, the, one of the big trends in the last, what, four or three years is Lots of work on uh, interactive learning on video games and on uh, inter like just directly interacting with the internet and sort of bootstrapping uh, your knowledge uh, from one domain to another. Um, so if you if you looked at all of these examples that I that I showed you, um, and from my perspective, from my mind, I see um, certain trends. Um, I, I call these a static versus dynamic. Um, it, what I see as static is uh, you have a model that has a collection of data that you, you have a data set, you have a training set and a validation set or whatever, and then you have a model that you train on that data with some objective, and you repeatedly do that, and then you take this trained model and then you deploy it to production. 
And whenever new data comes through, you send it through your model and you get some prediction. So typically, you collect your data beforehand. It's a neural network of some sort. Or if you do something like uh, a gradient boosted tree or something, they're, they're just like these specific static models that you predefine. They don't have particularly interesting control flow or recursive structures, or for that matter, augmented, explicitly augmented memory. And it's all offline learning. You, you basically have, you learn things beforehand, and then you deploy them into production. And these examples that I showed you on, on the screen, they're, they're the static kind. You, you basically train your model beforehand, and then you deploy it into, uh, in, in, into production, for example. And then I've been seeing uh, a lot of new uh, research, new applications that I am bucketing into what I call the dynamic kind, where you, you can have uh, several different things, but not always at the same time. You have live data, data that is coming from interactive environments like robots or playing video games. Um, or interacting uh, like on the internet, for example. And then uh, you learn online. Your algorithm itself changes. It either uh, fine tunes itself online uh, using the live data, or it uh, trains itself from scratch uh, using this live data. And another thing is you have these models um, that actually change their, their fundamental structure based on the uh, data that is coming in. For example, if I have a sample one that is coming in, let's say my model has this particular structure. And when it sees sample two, there is some controller in the model that actually changes the structure of the model itself. Um, some examples um, of these are uh, recursive nets, which sort of um, they consume their model uh, in a recursive way, and it like depends. Uh, sorry, consume their data in a recursive way, and depending on what input data you give, the actual high-level operations that get executed are uh, fairly different. And you also have a lot of meta-learning going on, uh, popularized by uh, Google these days, where you sort of learn to learn uh, architectures um, in the hope of getting better performance. And the other thing is um, with, with things like memory networks and uh, neural Turing machines, but also just um, uh, models that, uh, that are uh, like net to net, you have this, you change the capacity of the model at runtime. If the model thinks that it needs to control uh, more uh, memory or it needs to push more things onto some stack that it controls, then it actually changes uh, itself uh, at runtime when it, dis like when it just fi feels like some objective uh, was fulfilled for it to change this behavior. And, and you have all these interactive environments uh, like self-driving cars, and uh, like this, this is uh, an example of... Uh, uh, a dynamic model where a question is coming in, and the, there is this program generator component um, that consumes the question and sort of generates another uh, program that goes into uh, the the features uh, th that goes into this execution engine that takes in this program and the features from a convolutional network and uh, it produces the answer. And this particular whole process is highly dynamic in the sense that the number of, uh, um, uh, the number of, uh, what do you call it? The number of uh, words in the predicted program and, uh, and how the execution engine processes these, uh, this predicted program uh, has a lot of control flow. Um, so that is generally, um, it's not the kind of models we saw, uh, at least I saw from like say 2010 to 
2013, 2014, maybe they existed but weren't as uh, mainstream uh, and um, uh, like didn't appear as much, but I see them appearing more and more. So as I see all of these models, um, which have these uh, control flow or which have uh, memory augmented uh, uh, controllers, one thing I was thinking was, well, okay, if I need to build tools to also capture the, these new kind of models, the, the dynamic models, then uh, what exactly do I need to build? So I, was, I, I used to be maintaining this tool called Torch, which was the, the previous generation of what uh, currently exists, which is PyTorch. And we were facing more and more issues where users wanted all these dynamic features. And we sort of needed to think of a new design of what we wanted. So uh, typically, to, to summarize dynamic models, uh, I would say they would basically have some explicit uh, memory, or they would be able to change their own structure over time. And, and they would also have some kind of online learning component, um, like they're either interacting with some environment or some agent, um, or fine tuning themselves on data that they're seeing at, at runtime. So in terms of tools, um, what I was thinking was, as I saw all these, uh, all these data points of things previous tools could not handle, one thing that was clear is that there needs to be clear interrupt with all kinds of dynamic environments, whether it's to robotic controllers or video games or to the internet itself. And then the second thing was to support these neural network models that uh, have control flow. Um, in a more natural way than what already existed. And that I thought was pretty important because it was more every year as uh, we, if we made a list of what our tool can support to the user's comfort, we were sort of lagging behind in this direction. And the third is as we are doing multi-domain research where you, know, you can have one system that is uh, going into images and video and also into text and is becoming this giant complicated mess, we need to have the framework stay out of the way of, uh, of, the, of the users, of the researchers themselves. So we wanted to build something with even more minimal abstractions than what we had before. And the fourth thing is sort of everything, every, Every model these days is becoming bigger and bigger, um, so we wanted to build something fast. And if you notice, there's a lot of tools to do uh, deep learning research. These are probably just a very limited set of what what's available. Um, but if you look at which tools uh, support dynamic graphs or uh, uh, very naturally, uh, they fall into these kind of uh, buckets. Um, PyTorch is something we wrote last year after going through an iteration of uh, why we thought we needed to build a, a tool that supported dynamic graphs and uh, online learning fundamentally. So um, what I mean by static graph frameworks or dynamic graph frameworks is in static graph frameworks, you typically pre-declare what your model is. Um, it, it, it can have control flow, uh, but it's very clunky to actually use. And it's harder to debug, especially if it's a very complex uh, model that you're building up. And in dynamic graph frameworks, it's typically you, uh, the model itself is code. If you write some Python code, for example, then that Python code itself becomes your model and is differentiable. That's the idea. Um, like so, um, having this notion of uh, uh, model as code and code as model changes the style of programming and enables, uh, in a much more natural way, uh, to build these uh, kind of uh, programs. And uh, so, PyTorch, as a, as a quick, uh, simple overview, we built out uh, an automatic differentiation engine, which is the core of the 
uh, framework which which allows you to write Python programs and differentiate things. Uh, and we have uh, uh, an NDRA library with GPU support. So if you use uh, something like NumPy today, it's an alternative to NumPy, but th which also has GPU support. And uh, it also has an optimization package that covers things like gradient-based optimization. And as any modern framework does these days, we support things like multiple GPUs, multiple machines, uh, and so on. Uh, as a quick side-by-side, -side, not that I expect you to read, but I just wanted to show how similar PyTorch as a programming model is to NumPy, except that in PyTorch, you can get the gradients of any particular operation with respect to any other particular operation um, as you build out your Python program. Um, just like a one slider on the PyTorch's Autodiff engine, uh, you you simply write your your Python program, and as it as you write your Python program, it's building out these uh, uh, this this graph in the background, and then you can f call backward on your final variable, and then it will, it will accumulate gradients uh, across all of your uh, user created variables themselves. Uh, there was a workshop yesterday on PyTorch, uh, so uh, I couldn't. Post, I, I'm sort of post-declaring it, but uh, um, I, I hope some of you did attend uh, the workshop yesterday. So to capture how what we wanted to build and what we ended up building uh, sort of related, PyTorch um, captures the notion of um, building out dynamic graphs much more naturally, and also because it's just like a deeply integrated Python package, you can interact with uh, um, environments that are uh, that already have Python APIs, and pretty much all of the environments uh, that that you want to typically use these days have Python APIs. So whether it's uh, a, a robotic learning environment or uh, or you know a video game interface, and uh, on average, PyTorch is as fast as any other deep learning framework out there. And uh, so with that, I pretty much conclude my talk. Uh, I hope I gave a summary of my, uh, my thinking of uh, the trends in, in, in uh, deep learning and uh, how they relate to me building out uh, new tools. Uh, so thank you, and this is the website for PyTorch, and it's built out by all these companies, not just Facebook, and also universities, and there's EPFL over there, um, and there should also be EDF, but I think I couldn't find the logo. Uh, so yeah, thanks.